This is Twit. Now, we've talked about industrial systems in the past. They can range from, you know, new systems all the way down to, you know, decades old systems out there. Some manufacturing facilities haven't even changed their lines for decades. And they are actually seeing an increased focus from hackers to start getting industrial systems with malware. Now, from what we've seen so far, if a hacker can crack a password, they can deploy a botnet anywhere on the network. Now, cracking passwords on an, an older industrial controlled hardware like a PLC can actually be easy for some of those modern techniques out there. Now, I remember being on a beer line once before trying to access PLCs with my ladder logic, and all I needed was an IP and a password to deploy the code. Now, I can take a gander and say that that's probably true for a lot of organizations out there even today. Now, here's an example of a botnet hack. A Dragos, which helps firms secure industrial control systems against ransomware, state-sponsored hackers and potential saboteurs, recently performed a routine vulnerability assessment and found that software advertised as a password cracker from the Direct Logic 06 or a PLC sold by Automation Direct. The software recovered the password, but not through the normal method of cracking a cryptography a cryptographic hash. Instead, the software exploited a zero-day vulnerability in the automatic direct PLCs that exposed the passcode. Now, besides recovering the password, it also revealed that there was also malware installed called Solidity. Uh, Solidity sorry. It made the infected system part of a botnet and monitored the clipboard of the infection workstation every half second for any data related to cryptocurrency wallet addresses. And these examples just call out that there needs to be additional focus on industrial control systems. The question is, what are organizations supposed to do here, especially ones that have used their same systems for over a decade? Curtis, I'm gonna bring you in first because this is a security problem, obviously, but it also means that there there needs to be a change in the way some of these organizations think. I can just think of probably a hundred different manufacturing from food to to all the way down to, uh, you know, you know, building a bike that might have these systems on their lines or even in their factories that that are that are open to exploit what what can organizations do to secure themselves well i i think the answer to that comes in the answer to the question how long have your systems been in place and who made them <clears throat> because let's let's admit if you've got plcs from a company like siemens on your line then it is likely that there are updates that can happen from the manufacturer. Siemens is still in business, still a good engineering firm. They can do things. If, on the other hand, you have some uh, high-end control or even low-end control that's been in place for 15 years uh, and you can no longer read who made it because the box that the controller sits in has been whacked into by a um, forklift so many times, then it may be that you can't do anything but do what I call Band-Aid security. Band-Aid security is where you lay something over the top of it. You end up having to put gateway security on, some infrastructures, network-based security, knowing that you have vulnerable devices on the inside. So this is one of those cases, while we talk about defense in depth and we talk about modern zero trust and all that, there are situations, this one, where you have to just try to make your perimeter as impenetrable as possible, knowing that if an attacker gets in, they can um, run lightly through fields of data on your industrial controllers. Right. Now, you, you brought up a good point. Um, you know, obviously, these things could be 10, 15 years old, and, you know, they, they're not going to be upgraded. They're not going to be changed, probably. Uh, you know, the question is, should they be maybe monitoring their network for more of this traffic rather than trying to go and update the device themselves? Should they be taking inventory of these devices and making sure passwords are changed? Cheaper, what do you think? What do you, what do you think is the, uh, you know, because you, you have a lot of experience with PLCs. Well, here, here's one of the things that, kind of chaps me fill in the <laughs> blanks is the vast majority of the PLCs that I've worked with can't be monitored short of pings and you can't right. ping too often because some of these PLCs their stacks are so fragile that if you do six pings in a row it tips over 
But that isn't the biggest problem. This I'm going to be the doom and gloom here. Um, Ars Technica did a really nice job on this article when they're talking about a lot of different things, especially password crackers. But here's the problem. I've worked in some really, really old industrial infrastructures trying to help them modernize. And a lot of PLCs don't even have passwords. In fact, they have no way of doing any kind of passwords, or if they do have passwords, it's clear text. Um, no excuse. You know, if you're converting over to a, a PLC infrastructure that is running on any kind of network, and trust me, Modbus, aka RS-485, is a network. It's a serial network, and it can only go up to, you know, maybe uh, 225 kilobits per second, but it's still a network. <clears throat> Um, I can easily demonstrate how I can clip onto an RS-45 network and peel off passwords being used to talk to PLCs. It's not hard. So this is something I'm, I'm, I'm shouting out to people like the American Bureau of Shipping. I was working on a ship. We were trying desperately to upgrade the PLCs. They were controlling things like rudder movement or how fast is the engine turning or air conditioning, or the generators, you know, all kinds of things. PLCs are everywhere on a ship. <clears throat> I wanted to go and change it from coax ethernet, which was running right next to high voltage uh, lines, to fiber optics, which didn't care as much. <clears throat> it took me a year of fighting the bureaucratic paperwork to get permission to change something that simple. I didn't even ask to change the PLCs. I just wanted to change the communication method so that interference on the coax ethernet line wouldn't keep PLCs crashing. You know, having a PLC crash for say like rudder control while you're on the high seas or trying to dock is a big bummer. <clears throat> well, here's the other thing <clears throat> that I want to send out to people that manage infrastructure on any kind of buildings or whatever, your contractor put in probably a set of default passwords. Maybe they, they got smart and went beyond standard default and changed it to something that you couldn't look up on the internet. Um, on things like smart meters or controls, so like being uh, an automatic transfer switch to flip, to force a flip between say a diesel generator and the grid. Those are all controlled by PLCs now. So when a contractor says, here's a set of passwords, uh, and here's, the, here's where in the manual you're supposed to change the passwords, for goodness sakes, change the passwords. <laughs> and oh, by the way, infrastructure engineers, you don't have to have the same password on every PLC. The control software has the ability to have different um, passwords, different usernames, different levels of users on every single control um, channel. This is not hard. You need to do a little bit of investment so that your air conditioning engineers, your power engineers and people like that get a little bit more up to date on how networks work because too many of these industrial engineers just say, well, I just won't, I just won't let anyone touch the network. It's like, uh, excuse me, you have boxes <laughs> out on your, on your manufacturing floor that are only opened with a um, screwdriver or with a wrench that has a network switch in there. Plugging a laptop in there with Sniffer or Wireshark or something like that will allow any competent hacker, even a, you know, even someone just getting started, can sniff passwords and in minutes be able to go and change the programming of your PLCs. It's not that hard. So, industrial engineers, you guys need to go and work with your IT group. Don't just start giving them lip service that, oh, yeah, it, we're, we're, we're making it so that no one can access it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Unless you're going to have someone physically guarding every single PLC and every single switch and every single access to your industrial control network, you might start thinking about being a little more realistic about passwords 
and about your PLCs. They're not that expensive. Um, they are a pain to change. Yes, they are. But going to one of the newer types of PLCs that actually can have encrypted communications would be most excellent. Well, you know, password changing passwords are hard, Brian, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, I've heard some scary things like uh, Stuxnet malware tweaked PLCs to actually manipulate centrifuge units of nuclear power plants. Scary stuff here. Now, the question I, I want to throw this to Curtis. Curtis, you know, if you have to keep these types of tools, these types of systems in place, especially in your old facilities, there's got to be some industry tools to help, right? Um, it kind of depends. You know, and, you know, let's look at Stuxnet. Now, Stuxnet was a nation state developed uh, piece of malware. It attacked a particular PLC, a Siemens PLC, one that was used for the gas centrifuges that Iran was using uh, to enrich uranium. And basically, it ran them out of control. Uh, even gas centrifuges that run at incredibly high RPM have their limits. And if you go past that, you end up destroying them. So what do you do? And the answer is that the first thing you have to do is admit that someone might want to get into your PLCs and that the possibility exists for them to do just that. Um, the idea that somehow we're going to keep them separate, that we're going to make sure that no one can get to them in any way, that's great if you can actually pull it off. Brian mentioned some of the issues that you have. And trust me, for most organizations, especially those that use older PLCs, having an armed guard standing beside their uh, production lines 24 hours a day just isn't a real option. So what do they do? They have to, as I said, admit that there's a, the possibility of an issue. Go and harden the perimeter as much as possible. Recognize that there are issues, especially if they are going and sniffing their data to send over to the IT. What we're seeing is that OT, operational technology, the controllers we're talking about, and IT are coming together more and more often because companies want to be able to have the data from their production lines to throw into their enterprise resource planning. So once you have that, that data flow, if you've got a connection, you've got a potential vulnerability. And it's not that hard to find. Um, Well-constructed Shodan searches will tell you an awful lot. And so admit that there's the possibility of a problem, hit it, at the perimeter, if you must, work with the vendor to harden the individual PLCs, if you can, and continually monitor what kind of network traffic is going on so that if you see something unusual going out to a location that is unusual, you at least have some warning that things are not as they should be within your uh, operational technology, and you can start immediately on remediation. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, perimeter detection is can help in many cases, obviously, especially these types of systems. Chibert, you know, we uh, Curtis brought up a good point about IoT devices. A lot of organizations are using these more. They're using smaller, cheaper devices here, like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, that kind of thing, in their settings. Is, is, is this better, worse? What, what can people do here? It's neither better nor worse. It's different. Um, <laughs> one of the things I really, really, really love about general purpose industrial control computers like the Raspberry Pi, Arduino, and so forth um, is that they are general purpose. <clears throat> I'm able to use, as long as you, so you pay attention and you, you have one that's hardened, um, so that at least you've turned off the ports that you aren't using. Use um, a you know a secure Linux kernel. You can do a lot of really cool things. And the best part is is instead of having to use proprietary 
um, industrial control monitoring systems that cost a king's ransom, <clears throat> I can use less expensive systems. Like, for instance, when I had to do one industrial control application, um, I actually used a product from Tim Titus. We've had him on the show several times. It's called Path Solutions Total View. <clears throat> Because there were so many devices that couldn't talk SNMP in the industrial control world, what I did was I did a half step. Um, I upgraded all the switches to more modern switches that could talk SNMP V3. And then we had Total Solutions monitoring the paths between all the switches and the devices. They couldn't monitor the device directly but we could at least see if there was a dramatic increase in the pattern of data transmission to and from those devices um, so that we're able to go and see if something has changed because that's one of the big issues on trying to find someone hacking you. You look for the deltas. And so by combining um, general purpose IoT devices, I can put those into key locations so I can monitor the health of quadrants or areas within an industrial control application, even if I can't monitor the PLCs directly. All great suggestions. I'm hoping at least some uh, decision makers are listening. If not, hopefully you, uh, you at home can convince your decision makers they need to make some changes here. <laughs> 